to the current Bible Babble. Uh, my name is Kenny Beisel. Um, I'm, uh, I don't have a, 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 an assembly that I pastor, but uh, I'm a 89 graduate of Grace School of the Bible. And uh, my, work, my work routine for a number of years kept me from trying to do anything at home because I worked a seven day rotating shift work in, a, in industry for a number of years. And, uh, but since the mid 90s, you almost need a mic, Kenny. You reckon? Almost. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, since the mid mid nineties, I've been grading papers for Grace School of the Bible. I'm an '89 graduate of there, and that's pretty much been my ministry since the mid nineties. And when Richard gives me an opportunity to speak here, uh, the title of this is the current Bible Babble. But there's a little phrase that I've kind of subtitled it that you might want to remember: things that are different are not the same. Okay. <laughs> That seems, you know, elementary, but people will try to who do you, especially over this issue. Uh, and uh, my outline that was assigned to me is, is a demonstration of the continued need for understanding the corrupt nature of modern versions and the consideration of why the so-called new King James Version is the most dangerous of them all. Uh, if you would, uh, open your Bibles to uh, Psalm 68, and while you're at it, uh, get Psalm 12 as well. I got on a mic, it's putting it on the, oh, oh, oh. it's putting it on there, I hope. Can I sneak in here? Sure. Sure. Certainly. Psalm 58, Psalm, Psalms 68, verse 11, and Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. And I'm going to Psalm 68 first. Psalm 68, verse 11 says, The Lord gave the word. And great was the company of those that published it. Then if you would flip over to Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. Psalms 12, verse 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer before we start. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for giving us your word so that we might know your will and not only giving it orally but placing it in written form and pledging also to preserve it down through the ages so that every generation is without excuse because they can know your will as we also today can know what your plan and purpose in every age is. And we give you all the praise in the name of the living word, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, if God gave his word and then preserved it for us, down through the ages, then where did what I've called the corrupt modern versions that are also claiming to be the Word of God come from? If you would, turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Actually, I'll start in about Genesis 2, 15. Yeah, Genesis 2.15, and we'll read down from there a little bit. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now drop down to chapter 3 and verse 1. God put Adam in the garden and gave him some instructions. Shortly after that, who shows up? Yes. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, notice that he doesn't address Adam, he goes to the woman. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The first thing he does when Satan shows up is he puts up a competing authority with the word of God. God said you can eat freely except for one and don't eat it. And God shows, or Satan shows up and says, did God really say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, no, that wasn't quite what God said. And Eve's response and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. She left something out. Freely. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Well, I don't recall that God didn't said anything about touching it. He just said, Don't eat it. And he said, you shall surely die, not lest you die. Maybe you'll die. And Satan's reply to that, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He denies it. And when he denies it, notice that he denied the original statement that God made. Thou shalt surely die if you eat it. So Satan comes along immediately and sets up a competing authority. So then, when there's two authorities, somebody has to make a decision about which one to go with. And they pick, made the wrong choice. So say, God has pledged not only to give his word, but also to preserve it. So Satan can't get rid of it. Get you a folder here, young man. Got some handouts. There you go. God has pledged to preserve it, so Satan can't destroy it. So he sets up a competing authority alongside of it. And from the beginning all the way out to the Apostle Paul, if you would, turn to 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 17. Paul's writing his second letter of Scripture to the Corinthians. And he, write, he, he says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. When Paul's in his travels and writing his epistles to the churches, there are people out there corrupting the word of God. Now to corrupt it means you go in and you change something in it, just like Satan's first statement to Eve he altered or offered a different version of what God actually said. There, when Paul is writing his epistles, there are, and he says, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. There are people out there changing the word of God. Uh, skip over to, to uh, 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, Paul's writing his second epistle to the Thessalonians, 
And he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Some people have written a letter to the Thessalonians under the name of Paul. They forged a letter from Paul and sent it to the Thessalonians telling them that the day of Christ is at hand. They've missed the rapture and they're headed into the tribulation. So, and Thessalonians is some of er Paul's earliest epistles and there are people out there already forging documents under his name pretending to be scripture. Satan's got little munchkins everywhere running around messing with the word of God. Okay? That's where these modern versions come from. In the first couple of centuries, more damage was done to the word of God than at any time because by about the second or third century, there are enough true copies of the text in circulation that when a change shows up there's enough people there have their copies and they can say wait wait a minute that isn't right and it doesn't get used it doesn't get replicated or anything like that they fall into disuse because there are enough copies correct copies of the original that are out there and up until about 200 AD or a little later they probably still had the original manuscript from Paul and the others that they could go back to the original and say whoa wait a minute see here this is this is the one Paul wrote that doesn't match after about the middle of, of, of the second or third century then they became deteriorated with age and time and disappeared. But the corrupt, there's people out there corrupting the text from beginning to end. Now, most of these folks, and these people do it too, this is a copy of the New King James Version that I used for a number of years till I learned better. Uh, reading it and finding things that didn't quite look right. Thomas Nelson Publishers is the people that put this out. This is a 19, has a copyright in it, 1979, 1980, and 1982 by Thomas Nelson Incorporated in Nashville, Tennessee. Now the reason there's three in there, when they were doing this in 1979, they put out their New Testament. In 1980, they had completed Psalms and Proverbs. And then by 1982, they had the rest of it finished so that they had a complete Bible. Um, and in the preface, and you'll hear other people say this as well, uh, on page VI, what is <laughs> six of the preface, there is more manuscript support for the New Testament than for any other body of ancient literature. Over 5,000 Greek, 8,000 Latin, and many more manuscripts in other languages attest to the integrity of the New Testament. Sounds like they think highly of it. Hmm. There is only one basic New Testament used by Protestants, Roman Catholics, and Orthodox, by conservatives and liberals. Eh, not Minor variations in hand copying have appeared through the centuries before mechanical printing began in A.D. 1450. That is not true. Who was that again? Printer? Uh, Thomas Nelson Publishing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's always, of course, the Roman, the Church of Rome has not really been a propagator of the text. They've been a destroyer of the text, always hounding down 
the heretics, which in common usage means Bible-believing Christians, the Waldensians, the Paulicians, if, if they had a group out there that, that they decided was getting too powerful and wouldn't bow to Rome, they overran them, killed them, and in the process burned their literature. So, but, but the, the Roman Catholic text is different from the received text, mainly because they also include the Apocrypha and consider it text, uh, scripture. Uh, the the uh, conference they held in, in, in the, and now it, it escapes my memory, but one of the things that they declared at the Council of Trent was that anybody that didn't believe that the Apocrypha was scripture was anathema, and they were heretics. So anybody that didn't bow to Rome was a heretic. Uh, one other statement they make in here, which I need to bring out. Um, Bible readers may be assured that the most important differences in the English New Testament of today are due not to manuscript divergence, but to the way in which the translators view the task of translation. Eh. That also is not true. While the modern versions vary, some of them being done a literal translation, others being done a paraphrase, like the, like the not inspired version, the NIV. But the differences between their translations and the received text is a textual difference. The underlying text that is being translated is the issue. And it began with the revised version of 1881. In the early or mid 1800s, the Anglican Church of England decided that they wanted a revision of the New King or of, of the King James Bible. Now, the Northern Conference of the Anglican Church they were satisfied with their Bible, but the Southern Conference decided that they wanted a revision, and so they put together a revision committee, and in 1870 began a revision of the King James Bible. Now the rules that the conference stipulated was that there were to be as little changes as possible in the, in the Bible other than where archaic words that really demanded a, a new updating, but that, that the changes were to be held to a minimum. That's not what really happened. There's a couple of fellows in the mid-1800s by the name of Westcott and Hort. Uh, hmm? Hort, H-O-R-T, yeah. Fenton John Anthony Hort. And the other one was Westcott. They were two Anglican uh, churchmen and uh, they had a dislike for the received text uh, I'm going to read the identity of the New Testament text by Wilbur Pickering uh, and I'm going to define the issue from this gentleman On page 16 of the introduction, he says, Thus, the fundamental difference between the New Testament and the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New English Bible, today's English Version, etc., etc., New International Version, on the one hand, and the King James Version on the other, 
is that they are based on different forms of the Greek text. There are over 5,000 differences between these two forms. So the issue is, again, is the text that they are translating. Uh, page 31, the Westcott and Hort Critical Theory. At the age of 23, in late 1851, Hort wrote to a friend, quote, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of texts, having read so little Greek Testament, and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus. Think of that vile Textus Receptus leaning entirely on late manuscripts. It is a blessing there are such early ones. And the early ones he's talking about, if you look in your folder, in the handouts, uh, first page has a Bible line, second page has some data. On the page that says the false witnesses brought forth against the received text by Westcott and Hort, there are about five main ones that these people go to. And in the technical terms, they are called unseal, U-N-C-I-A-L, text, which, which is just a weird word for all capital letters. The Greek text is written out in all capital letters. They have very little punctuation. If you look at a page of it, all the letters are all run together. There's no space between the words to differentiate, and there's very little punctuation. But that's the time. It's the classical manuscript. The two that they really go to, one was found in the late 15th century in the Vatican Library, covered in dust. The other one was discovered by a German Bible critic by the name of Tischendorf in a Roman Catholic monastery in the Sinai Peninsula. It was in a trash can, and he, he found it and took a look at it and decided that it was in a very early manuscript, and so he took it with him back to England, and these two <coughs> manuscripts wound up in the hands of Westcott and Hort, and that is what they formed or edited their Greek text from. Now on this page there's some statistics about these, I've got three of them listed, the other one is, is D. Uh, the Vatican manuscript has the identifying letter of a capital B, that often the way you'll find it referred to if you read some of these books about Greek text. The one that Tischendorf found in the, in the Sinai Peninsula is called the Sinaitic or Sinaiticus, and the identifier attached to it is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is Aleph. I tried to get my computer to print that letter off, but I never could figure out how to do it. I'm sorry. But uh, the letter is called Aleph. What it looks like, if you see it in some of these books, it looks like a lazy Z laying on its side with a thick bar running down from left to right and then a little dot up here with a pigtail on it, and a dot down here in the other corner with a pigtail on it going up, and that's the Hebrew letter Aleph. But, um, and this, this um, these statistics came out of this book here by Dean John William Bergen. He was another Anglican churchman in the late eight, 1800s. He passed away in 1886. But he was a serious student of the text. He found several texts and did some collations. And uh, this is a refutation of the 1881 revised version. He, point by point, attacks it and demonstrates it to be unworthy of usage, both the revised version and the West Carton. Boy, can't talk. The Westcott and Hort text 
that underlies it. He did a thorough debunking of it from end to end. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting read, but also it's a little bit of a difficult read because being a 19th century uh, educated man, he tends to use a lot of Latin phrase, phrases over it. What was his name? Uh, John William Bergen, B-U-R-G-O-N. And, and so sometimes I'm reading down through there and you come to something that I don't have a clue what it is. A couple of them I've gotten on my computer and Google to find out what they mean. But, um, and, he, and sometimes when he's referring to the Greek text, he will print out the Greek text. And I, I'm no Greek guy either. I'm, I struggle in English, okay, even though I've been using it for almost 69 years. <laughs> it's, maybe it's Southern English, but anyway. Uh, but it's an interesting read because he is always clear to the point and, and calls a, a spade a spade and a boo-boo. Some things more than a boo-boo, <laughs> a mistake. But uh, that's an excellent read if you, if you can jump around the Latin and the Greek. But that's where I garnered the statistics that are on this page. Now, this is a comparison where it says words across that, that row, words omitted is the number of words that are omitted. The next column is the number of words that are added. The next column is the number of words that are substituted for a word in the Greek text. The next column is a number of words that are transposed. That is, if they're in a, in a sentence or a phrase, they've been, their order's been exchanged. And the other one is the number that are modified. That is, in the Greek text, there are a lot of little, little squiggles or jots and tittles. It, maybe the word, maybe they've left something off or they've added something to it or a letter to it which actually changes the meaning of the word. And this is a comparison only of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not the whole test, New Testament, just the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and they're compared to the received text that underlies your King James Version. And the Vatican manuscript, you'll notice, has omitted 2,877 words compared to the received text in just those four books. It's added 536, it's substituted 935, it's transposed 2,098, and it's modified 1,132 for a total number of changes of 7,578 words in the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The, the Sinaitic, Sinaiticus text is even worse. 3,455 omitted, 839 added, 1,114 substituted, 2,299 transposed, 1,265 modified for a total of 8,972 changes to the Greek text in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That they differ that much from the received text that underlies your King James Bible. It's a textual issue. And they took those two Greek manuscripts, combined them together, and came up with the text that they had printed or published at the same time as the 1881 revision was published because they were included in the revision committee and they conspired by letters in between themselves and other people when they went into the revision committee, they took their Greek text in with them, handed them out to everybody, and swore them to secrecy about what Greek text they were using. And so the revision of 1881 that came out was not the King James Bible. It was a new translation off of a new Greek <coughs> text. Yeah. And every new modern version except one since that time have come off of that Greek text. 
the modern keepers of it is the Nestle's critical text, which is now in its going between its 27th and 28th revision. Because every time somebody finds a new piece of parchment that happens, they decide happens to be part of the Bible, a Bible New Testament text, and it happens to coincide with the received text and match your King James Bible, uh-oh, they got to make a revision. <laughs> And the UBS, which is United Bible Society's text, which is between its fourth and fifth revision right now. And those two critical texts are used in every new translation since 1881 that has come out, except for one. So all these Bibles come off of a false text that Westcott and Hort came up with and it's from all the Greek stuff the Greek and it's and it's from these Greek manuscripts now they like them because their theory and method of finding the proper Greek text for the New Testament is that the oldest is the best. Why is it the best? Well, because it's the oldest. Well, and they disregard all the other evidence. The other, they take about 45. At the top of this first picture that you have in there that gives you the, that says providential preservation of the text, Right up in the top here where it says the traditional text line, this is the text that matches the received text or your King James Bible. There's 5,210 manuscripts known to be in existence at this time or who, when, whenever this was put together. I, don't, I, I found it in my books and I don't have a date on it. I just replicated it. If you look on the other side, it says the Alexandrian text line. And there are approximately 45 manuscripts in that line. That's where they go to get their Greek text. Those texts, there's five of the, of the main UNSL capital letter ones. Some of the others are um, in, uh, Egyptian papyrus text. Now there is, there's no complete text in papyrus anywhere because it's a rather poor grade paper material and so it degrades even in the dry climate of Egypt it degrades pretty fast so there's not a complete New Testament text anywhere in papyrus there's just fragments but some of them I think a couple of the biggest pieces they found match the the Westcott and Hort text line but there were it comes from Alexandria, Egypt. There were all kinds of heresies in the Egyptian area. Uh, Origen comes from that bunch. Uh, Clement, those two guys on that are listed on there, were were heads of a of a school in Alexandria that uh, propagated false copies. Or altered copies of the text. Oregon and Clement? Yeah. Uh, Clement was the first head. It's on that page there. Uh, from about 150 to 215 AD. Uh, he accepted Greek philosophy and the Apocrypha as divinely authoritative. He was head of the uh, catechetical school there at Alexandria and the belief that salvation could be obtained through various means including baptized faith and works or faith alone he, he was a he was just a kind of grab bag sort of guy just whatever you thought was good was <laughs> okay with him he was followed by Origen he became the head of the school after him supposedly he was a man of rather superior intellect However, he denied the Bible's historicity. He denied eternal punishment. He was the first Jehovah Witness. 
no hell. Um, the Holy Spirit's eternality, salvation by grace, and he was given to allegorization of the scriptures. He liked to allegorize them. And uh, he was big on, on Greek philosophy, too. That uh, Greek philosophy over, you interpreted the Bible based on Greek philosophy rather than vice versa. So these guys were corruptors of the Bible. Origen was in Alexandria for a number of years, and then he moved to Caesarea, and a couple of years after he was at Caesarea, all kinds of corrupt manuscripts began to show up wherever this guy went. Of course, Dean uh, Bergen had something to say about the issue as well. In regard to the text, and and uh, oh, you said Dean Bergen, I hear you said you spoke with John Williams. Yeah, well, he was a dean in the Anglican Church. Oh, gotcha. So. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to confuse you. we've just talked about the manuscript evidence, that is the Greek text that were available. That's not all of the source material for determining what the actual text is. From the very earliest, it was being translated into other languages. Um, in the Syrian area, up near uh, Antioch, the what's called the Peshitta, which was a Syrian translation of the New Testament, uh, there are copies of it that they have, have uh, estimated the age from anywhere from about 90 AD along there. And some critics have even said it's possible that the Apostle John might have had the, a Peshitta in his possession because early on they were translating the scriptures into other languages as well as just copying the Greek. And so there are an, a, a number of translations that are available, early translations that are available, and you can see what the text that they were using was. There's also something ca called patristic writings. Patristic is a word for fathers. They're talking about the church fathers, the early bishops and such in the churches, where they, there was a, a voluminous exchange of letters back and forth between them, talking about the text, as well as refuting heretics and that sort of thing. And in their letters, where they would quote from the scripture, you get a testimony to the text that they were familiar with and used. And then there's something else called lectionaries. Uh, if you've been in other organized churches where you pick up the songbook and you open in the back, there's uh, various scripture readings back there for, for congregational reading. And so they've got copies of those that, that go back to about 400 AD that they're aware of or in existence. And you can gain from that the script scriptures that were familiar to the people in those assemblies that use them. So there's a number of other, and it's a vast amount of information that these two guys ignored. They built their text on two old Greek texts that they decided almost with a uh, superstitious devotion to that this was the residency of the true text. 
And something I don't believe I mentioned in comparing these, all those differences between them and the received text, in those two texts there are over 3,000 differences between the two of them if you lay them side by side. So they're not even a good witness. They, they disagree between themselves in over 3,000 places in those four books that were compared. So the issue is a textual issue. They have substituted a false text for the received text. And over the last hundred or so years, it's been the ascendant text. All the new translations that have come off since 1881 with the exception of one, follow that text. So Satan's been rather successful with his guys in an attempt to unseat the King James Version. Now, I said before that all of them except one, that one exception of a modern version that does not follow the Westcott and Hort text is the New King James Version. They, in fact, did translate the received text into English. But, it's a deception. The statement of purpose issued by Thompson Nelson Publishers of the New King James Bible, New Testament, in 1979 makes the following claim. Not to add to, take from, nor alter the communication intended by the original translators, but to convey that communication in 20th century vocabulary and usage. That would sort of give you the idea that, that they received text people. But this is some information I got off the internet by a fellow by David, by the name of a fellow by the name of David Cloud. It's called "What About the New King James Version?" And he had some correspondence with the man that was the executive editor of the Old Testament portion of the New King James Version, a Dr. James Price. In an April in April of 1996, he admitted to me that he is not committed to the received text, and that he supports the modern critical text in general. Quote. I am not a TR advocate. I happen to believe that God has preserved the autographic text and the whole body of evidence that he has preserved, not merely through the textual decisions of a committee of fallible men, he's referring to the King James translators, based on a handful of late manuscripts. The modern critical text, like NA 2627, that's the Nestles, and UBS provide a list of variations that have been that have entered the manuscript tradition. They provide the evidence that supports different variants. I am not at war with the conservative modern version such as the New International Version and the New American Standard Version. James Price emailed to David Cloud April 30th, 1996. So it's obvious that Dr. Price, who was the head of the Old Testament Revision Committee, has no love for the received text that underlies our King James Bible. Worse than that, That's New King James, right? yes, the New King James. The New King James makes thousands of unnecessary changes. There are estimated 100,000 changes that averages about 80 per page. And now, there's probably a, a reason for that. The New King James Version is copyrighted by Thomas Nelson Publishers. U.S. copyright law states that for a derivative work, that is, if you're revising something to publish again, that there must be significant differences in it in order for you to copyright it. You can't just change a few commas and change a few spellings or update a couple of archaic words that doesn't count as a work worthy of copyright. So in order for them to copyright it, they had to make significant changes to the wording 
in order to get a copyright. Now, in making those changes, there's a few places where there are some serious issues. If you would, get Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. What is it again? Matthew 7, 14. And I'll bring to mind a speaker yesterday, just before lunch, Brother Russ Hargett, where he was talking at the end of his message about a young fellow that was at camp, that got saved at camp, when he, he presented the gospel to him, and he believed, simply believed the gospel and, and got saved. Matthew 7, 14. I'm going to read from the New King James, if you'll try and follow along with me there. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. It's difficult to get saved. Difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. The gospel is simple when it's properly presented. Uh, come to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 16. Hebrews 2 and 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. <laughs> Does any say anything about giving aid to anybody? It says he took upon himself the seed. He did not take the seed of angels, but he took upon him the seed of Abraham. He became one of Abraham's seed. And what does it say? Is that, that thing again? He, give, he, he did not give aid to angels, but he did give aid to the seed of Abraham. <laughs> yeah. Well, drop down to uh, chapter 3, verse 16. For who having heard rebelled, indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Is that what? <laughs> Yours doesn't say it was all. That's a mistake. It said not all that came out with Moses rebelled. There were some, but there were some who did not rebel. That's a mistake. That's a change that severely affects the reading of the text and the outcome of the text. And they claim in the preface that if there was any change to anything like that, any, any textual changes, that they would footnote it. There's no footnotes on that verse, none whatsoever. They just sneak that in. Yes? This happened notice in our rooms, the Gideon Bibles. The yes. Yes, I've noticed that too. I've seen that there. Matter of fact, I'm I'm in the volunteer fire department at home, and the chief brought in a box full of Bibles that somebody had given him. They were Gideon's, yeah. New King James. Yeah. I said, "Man, throw them things away. They <laughs> they're dangerous." Now, in regard to the footnotes, because man, I'm running out of time here. Um, they claim in the, in the in the preface that if there were any changes to the text, they would, they would footnote it in the footnotes. Well, they didn't there in Hebrews. And there were supposed to be cross-references for helps and that sort of thing. Well, 
I personally sat down with this New King James second to last page in your little notes there it's titled the New King James footnotes are used to undermine the translated text I went through each book in the New Testament counted the number of footnotes in each book